This morning, we have very great pleasure and a very great privilege in welcoming a most distinguished airman to the Staff College. Air Vice Marshal DCT Bennett, better known, of course, as Pathfinder Bennett. Sir, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this Thank morning. You. Very great pleasure. I wonder if we could start by just asking you to reflect on your first days when you came from Point Cook right. to join the Royal Air Force. You were mentioning a few moments ago that um, you were mistaken to a certain extent as a short service officer by some of your British colleagues. Uh, yes, well, of course, that was natural because that was the one of the main forms of entry here. And although I had been through Point Cook, which is the equivalent of Cran Cranwell, we came in as short service officers when we got here. And this was in the middle of the Great Depression, you may record your young people. Uh, and we all had to knuckle down and accept a lot of things that were abnormal. But I was fortunate in coming over here because it changed the whole of my career in the Air Force. Whereas if I had stayed in Australia from Point Cook, it would have been much more inhibited and restricted yes. in sphere and character of, of experience gained. Your first squadron was 29 squadron. That's right, right. on Siskins. Siskins. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, which had its own peculiarity. Uh, the Siskin was uh, a bit of an atrocity. If you held it off slightly hard, you dropped a wing. I had one friend who wrote off five Siskins in one week. You could do it. But it was good for you. You had to fly it all the time, both in the air and landing and taking off. And particularly night flying, which we did. In fact, it was the first night flying that I had done uh, on a grass field of a few hundred yards with paraffin flares. Combined with a Siskin, it made you uh, pay attention. Sporty, it yeah. is. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you didn't spend all that long on 29, did you? No, I was uh, almost one year, and I then went to uh, Calshot, which was a sort of turning point in my career, because although I went onto the flying boat uh, pilot's course, a six-month course, basically it started me off in the sphere of navigation. Could, could I ask, what, what is it that led a fighter pilot to volunteer for a multi-role flying boat course? Uh, I think I deglamorized the fighters and yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be, if possible, as wide an experience yeah. as I could get, yeah. and in particular to fly heavies. You see, the heaviest I had flown before that was a Wapiti, yes. and to get on to the, what was then the heaviest in the Air Force, these great big twin-engine Southamptons, <laughs> was a sort of ambition. Yes. And it led to the navigational side. Right. Which, which is a very, very important side, which I'd like to come on to in a moment. If I, if I may, sir, I'd, I'd like to pursue two themes in the conversation. Yes. One is your changing <coughs> impressions and relations with what was to be your parent service, your adopted service. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the importance of the navigation development. And I wonder, just before we, we look at Calshot, mm -hmm. just before we leave 29 Squadron, what sort of impressions did you form? What, was 29 Squadron what you expected it to be, or did it differ? Or, or what? were your responses as a young Australian <laughs> man coming well, across it was the mixed. I mean, in some ways I was delighted, in other ways I was disappointed. We had a very excellent, very Irish, Southern Irish squadron commander who was a jolly fine fellow in many ways, but uh, he was terrified of a thing called flying. And so the slightest bit of bad weather or anything like that, we were grounded, and that sort of thing I found disappointing. Um, on the other hand, there were others who were a little bit the other way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I, I think I saw a, a good cross-section of Air Force officers at North Weald, good and bad, um, old women and wild animals. I mean, everything from one extreme to the other. And so, to that extent, it was very educational. And um, I learned things, for example, my squadron commander said, if you take any notice of the English weather, you'll be miserable. Ignore it. He also gave me the very good dictum that there is only one way to fail in England, and that is to be right. <laughs> oh, you remembered that. Yes, so, remember that. he's quite right. One thing that is unpopular in England is to be correct and to say things that prove to be true. Whereas if you make a drop a clangor, everybody's sympathetic for you, and, and they like you. And well, it's a characteristic of the nation, not only the Air Force. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> let's, let's... I don't agree. Well, I... I Perhaps over a jar later on, sir, yeah. if we could have a word about that. 
Going on to Calshot, this yeah. this was clearly to be, if there was going to be a turning point, it was going to be this, wasn't it? It was, yes. Um, perhaps you'd care to say a, a couple of words about the translation, as it were, of the fighter pilot into what one could call a master navigator, I suppose. Well, um, yes, from the point of view of handling of aircraft, the Southampton was an excellent thing. I had an instructor who complained that I flew the Southampton like a fighter, which uh, he didn't approve of entirely, but in fact uh, was uh, uh, symptomatic. I mean, there is no difference in aircraft. They are aircraft, and you must be master of them. If you can master a fighter, well, then you can master a Southampton or anything bigger. The important thing is that you are in control completely and absolutely, both in terms of the levers themselves and everything that's going on inside the engines. That, that makes a captain of aircraft. And I think my transfer to Calshot brought home to me the fact that aircraft are aircraft. And land or sea also doesn't make any difference. In spite of the flying boat union telling me that, oh, you'll never learn handling on the water, just like that. I, uh, well, I wrote a book on seamanship in the end, terrible thing to do, uh, but it, it's all common sense and handling a seaplane on the water, a flying boat, um, is not different in general concept mm -hmm. to the general command of an aircraft. Yes. yes, I know you've got views on what command of a multi-role aircraft, multi-engine aircraft yes. involves. <laughs> Before we get on to that, um, again, in 1934, I think it was, January 1934, yeah. you decided to take the Master Navigators? Yes. Um, I was then in a dual posting at Carshot yes. as a navigation lecturer and as a flying boat pilot. And you had and a boss who was a good delegator, I believe, didn't you? I, I had a... A man who delegated his responsibilities. Yes, that's right. Yes. Who found it necessary for me to take his lectures almost every day. <laughs> and so I was lecturing almost double time. Because of him, he was uh, always too busy to take his lecture session and so say, would you do that then? Which was very good for me because I, if you have to teach, you have to learn. You can't go before a class and uh, get up and make a fool of yourself. And that was one of the most helpful things of the lot. And because of that, I covered the ground in the navigation sphere for the examinations that I would have found very difficult otherwise. And presumably that time you found large gaps in navigation training, navigation Well, equipment. not only in the training, but the equipment and everything else, and in methods. Um, you see, we lost, we had a, a, at the end of the war, World War I, uh, a few ex-naval navigators in our airships yes. who got lost on that great crash. And when the RO oh, was lost, yes. we lost three navigators. And therefore there was room for people like myself, for young people to um, be able to analyze. And people like Henry Hughes and Sons, the instrument makers, and uh, all of these people came to us. They wanted to develop things. They wanted uh, new ideas and what was needed. And many of the things that we talked about in those days subsequently came good, and I'm pleased to say most of them came good before the war started. Things like the air position indicator followed by the ground position indicator, astro compasses, um, automatic bomb sites, all of these things were initiated in those early 30s. I wonder if you'd have had the same interest if you'd stayed on 29 Squadron, because obviously the problems of navigation were not the same, yeah, flying right. over land. The yes. answer is no. no. If I had had a narrow career and saying I'm a fighter boy and I'm staying on fighters, yes. my career would have been absolutely nothing and my contribution to aviation would have been nothing. But by changing, taking opportunity as it came, and then, put, if I may say so, putting a certain amount of hard work into it, uh, I mean, I used to study till two in the morning at Calshot. I, I wasn't a, a nine till four chap. No. I, I notice the impact we have down in the library here. Um, your, I'd say, a little book, only little in size, yes. on, the navig on, on navigation, on aerial navigation. And yes. I notice that went to five editions by 1936, I think. Mm, that's right. So there's obviously a It went to eight altogether. Yes, um, yes. So there's obviously a It was uh, worldwide accepted as the navigation textbook. Yes. Um, I mean, even in South America and places like that, my book was produced and saying, would you please autograph this for me, uh, after the war. Um, fortunately, there wasn't much competition. 
Uh, the Americans produced one or two books, and there was one other in this country. But basically, um, I got the market, as you mm. might say, and yes. it that helped me in itself because um, when people criticised my rather unseemly promotion during the war. Uh, people who had done it were able to say, well, look, have you written a book on navigation? Do you know anything? And so on. And as an indication of qualification, it was a help. You were still restless, though, weren't you? Because looking at your autobiography, I, I, I get that there is obviously there are things that aren't written in the autobiography. Um, at the end of your short service pattern, pressure was put upon you to stay. Yes, but you was. didn't. Why not? It was um, a mixture. Um, I would like to have stayed. I would say I was very, very happy in the Air Force, and I would like to have stayed. But Sir Tom Webb Bowen, he was a retired Air Vice Marshal, uh, who had gone to Imperial Airways at the government request to prepare for the Atlantic and the big development on the Empire routes. And he came to me and said, look, we want you. You've got what we want in the way of navigation. You're a flying boat man, we're putting flying boats on the Atlantic, we're putting flying boats on the Empire route and so on. You've got all the qualifications we want. Um, and from the point of view of, of civil license, he should get your licenses. So I got every license there was. So he was very ready to take me at the end of the uh, 1935. And uh, the attraction was mainly flying. Yes. I mean, I would not have flown the Atlantic. I would not have flown all over Africa and Asia um, in the Air Force as right. I did as a right. civilian. It's a great I, that really was another help to establish me when the Second World War came. Instead of saying, I've got a thousand hours, I'm a jolly good bloke, I was able to say I've got nearly nine thousand hours, eight thousand five hundred or something. Yes. And this in itself, the gaining of experience was one of my main ambitions, because I knew that that would establish me. Yes. Yes. It's a great pity, sir, that we've got to leap over this next period because right. I'd like to pursue the Mercury and the Maya sequence, yes. which in itself it is, is, is yes. epoch, epoch making. But if we could come, I think it's 1938, it might have been 1939, where you're still flying as a civilian. Yes. You start to make contact again with the Royal Air Force. Yes. I remember you commenting in our previous conversation about a visit you made to Lucas when you were still a civilian. Yes, at Luc I was up in Lucas during the Nuren, the, um, uh, you know, Munich. when Chamberlain the, the, went the Munich. Uh, across swords with Hitler and came back waving a piece of paper saying, yeah. peace in yeah. our time. I was, uh, I mean, I was the, I wouldn't say the only one, but I was a, a very unpopular minority in the mess at Lucas, holding the opinion that this was a sellout. This was what we subsequently called appeasement. But Chamberlain convinced the people and a large number of Air Force officers fell for it. Well, this is the only thing we can do. We must make friends with the Germans. Do you think that was because of a false awareness of the strength of the German air forces at the time? Uh, undoubtedly it was. I mean, they were producing um, false evidence, oh. uh, uh, feeding it into our intelligence system that they had 5,000 of this thing and 5,000 of that in storage, all of which were phony. Uh, Churchill was the only one who debunked them and said, These are, this is nonsense, they're nothing like this strength. Uh, but the government and the air ministry swallowed it. And I, I think this was largely to blame. And also a very poor equipment, of course. Yes. I mean, you take Lucas, they had Anson's. Yes. And they said to me, well, what do you want, want, do you think we should fight with Anson's? I mean, we'll be shot down like flies, which was perfectly true. Yes. Yeah. They were an inferior aircraft in inferior quantities. And the real drive for production hadn't got going. Yeah. To that extent, they were being realistic. But my attitude is that to be realistic is all very well, but to be a, a defeatist is far worse. Yes, yes. <laughs> so moving on from 1938-1939, war breaks out, and as my memory tells me, you were still engaged on the transatlantic uh, yes, that's right. Lines. I was actually development pilot for right. the uh, airways, and as such, I did the Atlantic automatically with composite aircraft and flight refueling. Yes, right. And then, after war breaks out, by this time, several friends from your short service days are beginning to move in different directions. Well, I'd like to move, if we could, sir, to the period when you began to take an interest in the affairs of Bomber Command. 
because yes. your unofficial interest, I know, began long before your formal appearance as the that is wing true. commander um, in uniform. Shortly after the, uh, towards the end of 1940, I was then running the Atlantic Ferry. And in fact, I came to England on the first delivery flight of Hudson's, which I led across in November. I can tell you it was Armistice Day, 1940. And I went in to see Director of Bomber Operations and uh, ACAS Ops uh, and the three musketeers, three wing commanders in that directorate who were friends of mine. And in particular, one who had been with me in 29th Squadron, a fellow called Cleland. Um, they had invited me to call simply to talk about the problem. And they'd shown me glowing reports of bomber operations, followed by PRU photos showing not a slate un out of place and no damage at all. Uh, and they said, well, what do we do about it? And that was the starting point. Now, many other people have thought of the Pathfinder Force, and they all claim to have been the first. But I think that, in fact, was the first. So you then moved, or I say not moved, <coughs> but from visiting MOD, you talked at length to people. Was it Wing Commander Bufton? Uh, Wing Commander Bufton was one of the three. Wing Commander right. Bufton, Wing Commander Cleland, and right. Wing Commander Hutchins. Right, and these are the three men. Yes. But further time elapsed, and then you decided that you wanted to come back into Bomber Command? No, it wasn't quite like that. It was a two-edged sword. The um, Atlantic Ferry was a civilian organization because America was a neutral. I was therefore still a civilian. And then Air Marshal Bohill. That's right. right. Bohill, having right. said it couldn't be done, was yeah. then sent out to relieve me because the Americans came into the war accidentally and uh, <laughs> Ginger Bohill was sent out to relieve me and he said, my boy, you're wanted back in England, something to do with the bombing business, I don't understand. You're off and I'm here. And that's how it happened. It wasn't uh, exact planning from the point of view of date because at that stage, um, Pierce, who was CNC uh, Bomber Command, was very adamant that he would not have Pathfinder Force, um, rather like his successor. Mm -hmm. uh, Their the reasoning was simple. You know, the casualty rate of these best crews would be far yeah. too high, yeah. and all the, all the arguments that yeah. were trotted out at that time. Uh, I came back, therefore, with the hope of starting it, only to find that when I arrived, and I should explain that I had, of course, had contact in between, but when I did come back, they said, look, it's knocked on the head, but this is a good thing, you better get in a few ops. And that, and that was when you went to, to Leeming? To 77. 77. Yes, Woodless, and Leeming. Yeah. That was a very good thing, and I'm very glad that the Pathfinders didn't yes. start before I was ready, as it were. Forgive me interrupting, sir, but did you then go straight into Bomber Command operations yes. as a squadron no, commander? No, not quite. Uh, there was a period of six weeks in the middle of the war in which I was totally unemployed because a junior clerk couldn't see how he could do the paperwork. Uh -huh. that, that is a known defect, yes. That, that, <laughs> That's that, right. that In the end, I did get to Leeming, and uh, on arrival, uh, Ruddy Carr was the AOC, and he happened to be an old friend. He's New Zealand, do you know? Not quite as black as the Australians, but... Uh, <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> well, <laughs> but he saw to it that I went straight on <laughs> onto Ops, um, and um, he rubbed my nose in it by putting me on Whitley's, again, a very good thing to do, morally and psychologically. Okay. And then I went to 10 Squadron on Halifaxes. Yes. But I did get in enough operations to see what a hot war was about, what the German defences were doing, and the difficulty of night navigation in Germany. Particularly navigation. Mm. Well, on the navigation side, I tightened up just on conventional methods with nothing new at all. Although I'd been in contact with the radar people earlier on, when I took those squadrons, I operated them as they were, you know, an airspeed indicator and a compass, mm -hmm. full stop. And we got results which were 20 times as good as any other squadron. My aircraft would come back with uh, nearly all aircraft had aiming point photographs, mm -hmm. which we also developed very yes. strictly. Yes. And um, uh, this showed uh, Headquarters Bomber Command that merely tightening up on navigational methods and precision um, achieved wonderful results anyhow. Yes. So, and then you took a spell of unexpected leave, didn't you? Well, I, I'm well. afraid I did. You know, the skiing in Norway is very good. Yes. But I did get shot down trying to do something which infuriates me because I now know that had I succeeded, it would have been a failure. Rolling mines under the turpid's keel 
Uh, the mines we were dropping were about, uh, I seem to remember, about 1,200 pounds each. We were dropping five of them. Had I got them under the keel, which was almost impossible, um, they wouldn't have done any good because subsequently the midget submarines put 5,000 pounds depth charges under them and didn't do any damage. <laughs> so it's, it was rather a fatuous thing. But there, there's a lesson. The Admiralty, frantic to try to do something, didn't mind how many lives they lost of that junior service. Um, and uh, I don't know whether they genuinely believed that it would work or not, but um, that's how I got shot down. Yes. It, it was the most heavily defended target in Europe. I had to go in low level, very low level, and uh, the depth of defences was such that uh, you hadn't a hope. Yes, hadn't a hope. This, this reflection about knowing now about the lack of damage. Yes. A comment I heard a very short time ago by a contemporary of yours was that one of the reasons why if low morale did occur in the early years of the war, it was not in any sense because of the fear of what the Germans were going to do. It was a fear that, or a belief that even if they did fight their way through, even if they did find the target, which the odds were against that anyway, then the amount of damage that was being done really was not justifying the losses. Well, that is true. After all, you think of the bombs we started with, 250 pounders yeah. and 500 pounders. Um, fortunately, I was a little bit out at that time. Uh, we were dropping 1,000 pounders by the time I got operating. Yes, yes. Uh, and we could, uh, I mean, even on a Whitley, we could take uh, 4,000 4, pounds yes. of bombs. Yes. It was effective by the time I came into it. But the early days, with the Ansons and the Blenheims, it was very disheartening. But there wasn't, at any stage, in my view, in wartime, any lack of morale. No. And as a whole, there may have been individual squadrons, right. but not right. as a whole. Right. Again, sadly, sir, we have to skip over this episode of you getting away from Norway into <laughs> Sweden, <laughs> then doing a daylight dash through surprised German defences with a... To, to get home, uh, yes. Uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a Hudson? Uh, a Norway? Yeah, well, actually, like a Hudson. Uh, it was uh, a Lockheed uh, Electra. Oh, oh that, yeah. yes, yes, yes. yes. You came back and then expected to be posted to the Middle East. Is that right? I didn't expect it at oh, all, you, but you it was going. suddenly Sorry, sprung yes. on me by people who didn't know that the Pathfinder thing was in the offing. Right. And the posting people in uh, AMP's department uh, said, it's, it's got to be, and it's got to be tomorrow. And uh, this, this frantic rush to try and stop it. And I got as far as moving from leaving with my Halifax squadron down to Hearn as a, a staging post, and refueling, and almost getting into my aircraft before I was stopped. Uh, I had let the people in DB Ops know that this was likely to take place. And they told me immediately, well, you won't be going, we'll stop you. But right up to the moment of takeoff, mm -hmm. the uh, bureaucrats had their way. And uh, it was only at the last moment that I handed over to somebody else and stepped ashore, as it were. So now, sir, um, we've reached the beginning, the spring of 1942, or mid-1942. Mid-1942, mid yes, yeah. And we are going to see the creation of this special Pathfinder force. Mm -hmm. Now, already you've commented once or twice that the previous CNC in particular, yes. and to a certain extent the current CNC, Air Marshal Harris, yes. are strongly opposed mm -hmm. to this. Now, if one looks through the established histories and one listens to what other people have said, you could be led to believe that Air Marshal Harris changed his mind about an elite force and about the losses, purely and simply because of equipment which, coming, which is coming to service. Now, I don't think that's true, is it? No, that's not true. Perhaps you could tell us what the real reason no, is. No, the, the, it's a bit complicated, but basically he opposed it for very good reasons. He didn't want the cream of the command, uh, the elite of the command, creamed off. It would weaken the main force squadrons too much. That was one of his reasons. The other was that they would then be shot down like flies because they would be out in front of the Hun would make special efforts to yeah. get them, which they did. But what he didn't understand was that there were some of us who had operated in the hot war who knew that countermeasures like supporting aircraft in big quantities and yes. things like that could relieve the pressure on the pathfinders. And these very legitimate reasons were disposed of after we started. But when we started, including up to when we started, and after, he continued to oppose us. He said to me, I will give you personally all my support, but I will continue to oppose the Pathfinder force. That was how I was appointed. Could you explain how it was that Winston Churchill came to suggest that Bomber Harry should change his mind? 
Uh, well, it was a question of results. There would be no bomber offensive unless it succeeded. But you had succeeded in getting a message to Winston Churchill, yes. hadn't you? Well, I had a friend at court, I should explain, <laughs> a yes, certain yes, Lord yes, Charwell. This, this is what I'm after. Yes. When he was a very great help because... You had known Lord Charwell a long time? No, no, no. There was nothing, nothing personal in it. It was purely technical. He was sufficiently scientific. But you had met him because of I your own scientific him, yeah. knowledge and your own working on scientific instruments development. Yes, uh, but as I say, that didn't... Uh, I would say that didn't influence him. He, he supported the Pathfinder idea objectively. Mm -hmm. But he did make it easy for me. He said, you always have the right to come and see me at yes. any time you wish. Yes. Yes. This was behind closed doors and yes. uh, totally improper. It wasn't the usual channels. Right. You may have heard of them in the Air Force. And, uh, but it was very effective because it meant that he could give orders to people like Sir Robert Rennick, who was um, controller of, uh, of radio and radar. It wasn't radar in those days, it was RDF. Mm -hmm. But um, by this channel, I had far greater influence than merely requesting as a small boy, please may I have something. And Charwell was able to convey things directly to Churchill, and this really swung the balance. And in the end, uh, and Portal came down also on the side of, uh, uh, of Churchill and Charwell and said to Bert Harris, look, you've got to do it. And although Bert had said over my dead body, quite literally said that, he in fact knuckled under to a direct order and did form the Pathfinders, albeit grudgingly, because although he said, well, if I do it, I've got to have Don Bennett to be the com commander of it, and he's only 32. And there was a great outcry against that. Uh, very naturally. Um, also, I'd made the mistake of becoming a civilian, you see, so, and I'd only come back then as wing commander. Mm -hmm. um, but he, uh, when he did accept the idea, he immediately looked for casualties, and we didn't have the terrible cra casualties mm -hmm. that he expected. And of course, by that time, I was working hard down at Defford, developing H2S and Oboe, mm -hmm. and these things appealed to him, yes. and that swung him, and so ultimately he was a great supporter of the idea, um, with some notable exceptions. Yes. Yes. So I wonder then, sir, if we just pick up a few points um, about the Pathfinder Force, I suppose starting at the beginning, recruiting. How, yes. how were crews, you had five squadrons, you were I given had five, five squadrons, squadrons to start with, um, and the idea was that the crews would be volunteer crews from the main force groups who were supporting them. Yes. Each one was affiliated with the main force group. And, uh, you know, 7 Squadron was 3 group and 35 Squadron was yep. 4 group and so on. And the AOCs concerned were basically very helpful. Uh, at the beginning, all of them were. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say we managed to get very top quality crews. Uh, later, particularly in one particular group where the AOC was openly antagonistic, we had the greatest difficulty. And what in fact uh, happened was that we had to dilute with direct entries. Yes. This wasn't an altogether bad thing because uh, the total strength was increased and I was able to use these direct entry people as supporters. Would, could you explain that, sir? Well, the idea was that the supporters would go in, at, supposing we were marking at zero minus one, the supporters would go in at, say, 0 minus 4 or 5. They would use HE Forgive only. Me, when you're saying 0 minus 1, you're t yes. time over target to, minus, uh, one minus 1. Minus 1, the yes. main force. Uh, 0 being the main, main force, main force starting yep. time. Uh, the supporters would drop HE only, so they did not attract attention at all. There were no incendiaries and no markers. They just dropped high explosive, which had the added advantage of discouraging the uh, defences because I don't know whether you know the psychological effect of a few thousand pounders going off near you. It really stuns you for about 48 hours. Uh, you know, it's quite a serious thing. So they were useful in that way. And also they got their training and they took their aiming for it photograph. When they were getting consistent results, then they moved on to marker roll and uh, did their stuff as proper pathfinders. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how we augmented recruiting. This ties up to the next thought because you were obviously training. You, you're doing now what we call as on, on the job training, aren't you? Yeah, that's you right. On the job training is my great belief. It's the best of all in any walk of life. I think, I think so. It's only fair to say that there, there were several occasions when, despite a firm personal friendship 
with Air Marshal Cochrane. You, yes. you did disagree very strongly. Professionally, yes, yeah, but not personally. No. And we never disagreed and personally. And I think training was one of the first things you disagreed about, wasn't it? Uh, very much so, because I believed in training on the job, and I believed in two pilots on board, so that the second pilot trained up to the stage of where he could take command. Uh, Ralph Cochrane believed in the opposite. He said, no, we can't afford to train men so many pilots. We must have flight engineers. Very excellent chaps and did a good job. But it meant that many aircraft went missing because of a new captain. The uh, casualties on the first three trips were far greater than the rest of the operation, the rest of the 28 to 30. Yes, so. Yes, and of course this was accentuated by the fact that Air Marshal Cochrane went to Five Group from a position in training, didn't he? Well, yes, he, he did. He immediately, he immediately applied his methods of training yes. and weakened the yes. group yes. accordingly. Yes. Um, Five Group had been commanded by Corriton, Alec yes. Corriton, one of the, I would say, one of the best Air Force officers ever, and certainly one of the best group commanders in, in Bomber Command. Uh, but uh, he had uh, problems, and um, yes. he left, and Ralph yes, Cochran yes. took over. The only, the only particular question I'd like to put to you about recruiting, um, I'm intrigued to know why you didn't accept Leonard Treasure when he volunteered for you. Uh, not quite that. That's, that's, that's it was mute. That is not right. That I didn't accept him. I, by all means, accepted him. Uh, he was a jolly good, typical bomber command pilot of the highest order, um, and I never disagreed. But we didn't agree on how and when. Uh, it was a mutual decision, not just mine. Oh, I see. And I would say that um, um, he had his own rather individualistic outlook, um, and he really, uh, as I recall it expected to be treated rather specially, uh, a little bit more than one would uh, expect in that context, because there were others in the Pathfinder Force with more experience and more knowledge, particularly on the navigation side. He yes. wasn't particularly, yes. I mean, he was a great operational captain, yes. but he was not a navigator. He wouldn't claim to be. He didn't have, um, shall we say, the particular professional qualifications that made him special. That's all. Mm -hmm. But we were not uh, unfriendly, uh, no. and, and now, no, not no. out to date at no. this moment. That, again, um, well, one can highlight a particular point of difference, because there was a tactical disagreement, wasn't there, between yourself and particularly AOC 5 Group. Um, I'm thinking particularly of marking, of marking levels. <laughs> Would you care to... Well, I think it's wise to get this straight. Uh, during the Battle of Berlin, which was a very bitter thing, because there was no element of surprise, and I just could not pull tactics that effectively reduced losses. I was running at 13% loss per raid. Work that out on the number of raids we did. But during this, uh, the CNC rang up and said, Cochrane says it'd be a good idea to try very low level marking on Berlin. Uh, what do you think? And I said, well, I don't think it would work. I said, I've flown over London in a Siskin at low level at night, and you just cannot map read over a metropolitan area, which is massive detail, uh, at night at low level. It wouldn't work. And he said, Cochrane thinks it would. And I said, well, I'm very sorry, but I'm not going to waste anybody's neck. He said, do you think it's dangerous? I said, no, it isn't the danger at all. It is the question that it wouldn't work. And uh, within five minutes, I had an order to move a squadron to five group. Mm -hmm. yes. Needless to say, they, five group never they? attempted to low-level mark on Berlin. Um, I don't disagree with low-level marking. I think it's wonderful. And I think it's got a wonderful future today, 1980. Uh, but to do it over a metropolitan area at night was crazy. Uh, the only time it was tr uh, tried was Munich, and I think if you look up the intelligence records, you'll find that it was uh, unsuccessful then, and the high-level marking had to be called in, did the marking, mm -hmm. the raid was then a success. Yes. But it did fail over the only other metropolitan area where it was ever tried. So far as open country is concerned, of course, it's the answer. It's wonderful. How, how happy were you about the sustained raid on Berlin? Very unhappy. I rang the CNC repeatedly. Couldn't the Prime Minister agree that we do one other target uh, every now and again, or even two nights running and then back to Berlin? And he said, no, we have got to show the world that we can go in the face of all they can throw at us and bomb Berlin. Well, of course, uh, he wouldn't believe anything I said. I mean, the main force groups who'd had their total takeoff weight, maximum takeoff weight increased, were dumping not odd thousand pounders in the North Sea, they were dumping their cookie because they were so uh, fed up with being shot down 
the casualties for them were almost as bad as Pathfinders, mm -hmm. the morale was low and we were wasting effort, getting nowhere, and a little bit of an interruption would have made all the difference. Yes, yes. Because I then could have pulled my spoofs and dummies. Very quickly, just a couple of moments, uh, you slipped in a statistic in a different sentence, and that was the loss rate, the Pathfinder loss rate in the Berlin War, mm. the Berlin phase, Berlin I should rate. say. Um, what, did you not say 150%? I lost 150% in the series, yes. In other words, I replaced my whole air crew strength one and a half times during those raids. And this was the worst thing that could happen to the command because these were the people who were marking. And uh, I could not, uh, this is one of the difficulties when politics take precedence over tactics. I couldn't convince the Prime Minister through the channels I had to go, even Charwell said, the Prime Minister has made this public statement, he's not going to retract. Mm. And we went on. Subsequent to that, there were two specific raids, which I'd like to ask you about. Yeah. One is the Friedrichshafen one, which I'll come back to. Yeah. And the other one is the Nuremberg raid. Yeah. And the reason I was asking in that context, you know, we were saying earlier about the temptation for the German night fighters mm -hmm. to get in among the raid. I think it's one of the points that hasn't been perhaps strongly enough made is that that night, for the first time, perhaps in the entire defense of the Reich, the German night fighter machine got its act together and put 240, I don't know if you knew this, they put 246 fighters into your bomber stream mm -hmm. and they were particularly looking for the Pathfinders and the Master Bombers. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure this had a serious impact on, on the Nuremberg Raid. I disagree with you. Would you? I don't think there's any such magic at all. It so happened to be coincidental that at that stage the radar on the ground and the organization of the fighter force had been brought up to a point where it was effective. But the Nuremberg Raid was a gift. Um, I mean, we simply did everything wrong that we could do. In fact, it was the nearest I ever had to mutiny. I had every squadron commander in Pathfinders come to me and say, this is crazy, we can't go. My crews are refusing to fly. Really? Because it was a deliberate invitation to Germany, straight in on a moonlight night yes. to a yes. deep penetration yes. target yes. and straight out again. Yes. You couldn't have asked for anything easier for the fighters. Instead of doing dog legs and yes. dummy targets off to one side or the other, which we always did, there was no deception at all and this was done entirely at the behest of AOC 5 group and uh, he won the day. I mean I tried to get other group commanders to support me. Two of them said well we'd better keep out of this argument. One of them supported Cochrane. Uh, that I did not know at all. Well that was the that. sum total of the Nuremberg calamity. 97 because aircraft lost. Right. The Germans, the German own, the German's own account. Mm -hmm simply states that the weather conditions were perfect, that the bomber stream came in straight and level, mm. and as you say, that the radar and the entire defence network just focused yeah, 246 had, fighters. They had nothing to throw them off. Yes. Nothing at all. One pilot got 17 confirmed kills that night. Did he One did fighter that, yeah. pilot. Yes. I'm not surprised. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, the, uh, the, 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 the question of tactics are, are vital to any operation yeah. where you're attacking. Yeah. And if you just uh, do a, a dead easy one and yes. hand it to the yes. defences, the defences yes. hack you down. Can this we turn from that one to yes. the very successful one on Peenemunde? Yes. How did conditions differ then? What, what made... Well, well, we didn't go straight to Peenemunde. For one thing, if you look at the routing, it was um, dog-legging and mosquitoes did do uh, alternative targets. Uh, it was a coastal target, it was nice and easy and of course also um, their radar didn't function uh, quite as well up that end as it, they did on the main front. The main front, you see, they had the Wurzburgs, they had everything laid on, and they were also using um, attempts to home on our H2S, yes. uh, which, of course, they knew the Pathfinders had the uh, uh, three centimetre and one and a half centimetre, one and a quarter centimetre, and the main force were all on ten centimetres. Um, there were things like that that were developing all the time, but the Peenemunde thing was properly planned and we'd carried it out as per plan. Mm. Uh, both the routing, the spoofs and dummies, yeah. and of course the tactics on the target itself. Uh, there was a book by John Searby, who was Master yes. Bomber. Yes. Uh, he's still alive and well. Yeah. Uh, it gives the details, particularly of the marking. And we systematically did that. We moved the aiming point, you know. and. Uh, 
which was a great success. And I think that slowed down the rocketry side of the German no, no attack doubt. by two years. Yes. Otherwise, we'd have been in trouble because uh, Charwell estimated he had me in on this, uh, on the mat, as it were. What was my opinion about it? But when we first got particulars, uh, he estimated that uh, they were going to be able to put something between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds in the warhead. And had they done that, mm. and done it in big numbers, we couldn't stop a rocket. We could stop a flying bomb, but yeah, we couldn't, couldn't stop a rocket, rocket at quite all. Quite and this would have been morally, I mean, the, mo the morale of London would have, uh, I mean, I just imagine it, living in London knowing that there was something coming that couldn't be stopped. Yes. Well, you could see that with the damage on morale that was done, mm. with the relatively few V2s that did land. Right. Before we move on to the the mosquito story, which I know yeah. you feel very strongly about, one. Um, there's one, the other raid, I haven't been able to sort out in my own mind because there are so many different reports. That's the Friedrichshafen raid, where I believe, um. am I right in thinking that a Pathfinder aircraft flew with five group in an attempt to combine tactics, or have I completely misunderstood it? The Friedrichshafen raid of 1944. Yes. Um, it's one you've sprung on me, and I, I'm haven't, sorry. I haven't looked it up, but uh, I seem to remember we did have a combined effort of some sort. Yes. Um, this, what date was that? It was 45? 44. 44. 44, yes. Um, it was, it was bef um, yes. in May, June of 1944. Yes. Um, well, I don't think there was much magic about that one, if I recall it, because it was a, a lakeshore target. Yes. Easy visually and in good conditions, if I remember rightly. Um, they're just, I think, I, it stuck in my memory because it yes. seems to me to be a point of divergence between yourself and Five Group. That, oh, that no. seemed, that's, and I know there were lots we of divergences. A, a lot, a lot earlier than that. that. But uh, this, this but particular the, one seemed to be an attempt to put the two forces together, which never quite worked. Obviously, yeah. I haven't... Well, I no, haven't I wouldn't say it never quite worked. I mean, the CNC often did it, yeah, the invasion oh. beaches. Yeah, yeah. Um, of the 12 ba big batteries, the 16-inch guns, five group were given two to do. Well, we did the primary marking with Oboe, but they master-bombed it yes. themselves. Yes. Uh, the rain and remaining ten were master bombing by Pathfinders proper. I see. Um, we did work together, and we worked perfectly amicably. But there was a great deal of gossip because Cochrane and I disagreed professionally uh, that um, built up yeah. a story yeah. of animosity which yeah. didn't really exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, there is a lesson, I think, to be learned there that cooperation is between men of goodwill and um, if somebody has goodwill, then even if they are a lot senior, as Cochrane was to me, he would have said to himself, well, this young man has got six times as much flying as I have, he's a specialist navigator, he's a specialist radio man, all of which I haven't got. He has operated a hot war, which I have not done, and would have accepted in good grace my opinions more readily. Let me just pursue that point, if I may say, or we'll just divert yeah. for a second. Um, clearly, we don't, I don't want to invite you to make any comment on personalities, but perhaps we keep, keep a general observation. It seems to me that however brave and distinguished and intelligent our leaders were, they had not flown for 77 Squadron or 10 Squadron. Were you very conscious of this gap in the senior commanders in the RAF in World War II? Um, I think that's a polite way of putting it. I was embarrassed by it. If I sat down to a CNC's conference with the main force group commanders, I was the only one at that table who had seen a hot war. And this was a tremendous disadvantage. Except, it was not their fault. Except it, perhaps for World War I, because you had one, one or two commanders who had yes, fought Yes, that is true. War I. But that, if I may say so, was very, very different. Yes. And that goes for any future war. If you have all your senior officers who are not up to date in experience, they will make wrong decisions. The only way to avoid it is to let them stick their necks out, risk senior officers. For every one air vice marshal you lost, you save 200 ordinary air crew, because there wouldn't be mistakes made. Things like the Arnhem, Arnhem parachute dropping, yes. sending people in at 2,000 feet in broad daylight. Yes. Nobody who would operate it would be so stupid. Mm. I'm sorry to be rude to the no, dear deceased chap, he was a good friend of mine yes. who was AOC, but that is the sort of mistake that is made if the senior officers concerned haven't got 
practical operational experience. Yes, well, I think that, that will obviously provoke a talking point, bearing in mind that it's a very clearly, point. after 30 years of peace, it's not easy to find air officers That's with that the kind trouble. of experience. And, uh, when war starts, yeah. we've got to be prepared to risk senior officers. There is another point, though, which is not controversial at all, at least not in that sense, mm -hmm. and that is your belief in the mosquito, and particularly the factor of survivability. Which I, I'd like you to expand on, sir, if you would. Well, the that is relevant. To the play, mosquito anyway. was uh, opposed by the air board, of the air council, and by uh, everybody on the grounds that this was uh, impossible to operate. One navigator, one pilot was not good enough to fly over Germany at night, and the, the task was too great, and so on. Moreover, being totally unarmed, it would be vulnerable to every fighter that came along, and so on. Uh, the people who made that decision did it in good faith, but they overlooked the facts. The performance, both in height and speed, was such that any foreseeable fighters were not likely to give it much trouble. Uh, what is more is that it was a perfectly comfortable and easy aeroplane to fly and navigate, and uh, although they said it couldn't be done, we put in the various new equipments as they came along. In fact, that's how it started with me. Um, de Havilland's came to me, or rather, a fellow called McMullen, who was commanding 109 when I first had squadron transferred to me, came to me and said, look, the Havilands have got a new thing, a wooden aeroplane called a Mosquito, based on the Comet. I said, well, I know the Comet well. This was the old yes, Comet. the old Comet. Old comet. From the, the record the, the, um, Comet. Havilland McCormick Robinson comet. race. And so there and then, that day, um, we uh, nipped down to the Havilands and had lunch and uh, came back with a Mosquito. We had the oboe installed within 24 hours. We were dropping bombs with it the next day on targets in England. We didn't tell anybody, but we, <laughs> we dropped them from 20,000 feet blind on oboe and got wonderful results. So I demanded, the, uh, de Havilland told me that a batch of 50 had been ordered by um, MAP um, over, over the heads of the air ministry. Uh, and these were available, bomber version Mark IV. So I said, this is mine, and uh, we went for it. And the opposition, of course, was tremendous. Everybody opposed us and said, don't be ridiculous. We had a joint meeting, which I often tell of, whereby every factor was told to me that was we couldn't get the equipment in, wasn't adequate for the navigator, and all of these things, all of which I answered satisfactorily, until they came to the last point, when Boscombe representative said to me, anyway, it's no good, you can't fly it at night. I said, oh, why not? He said, well, the exhaust back flame when you're landing blinds you completely, you can't see what you think. And I said, well, sorry to hear this, because I didn't know, and I've been flying the mosquito every night this week. <laughs> and yes, that debunked that yes. one, so we've got our mosquitoes. The only other point that I'd like to ask you about there is the bomb load. Yes. Because wasn't one of the oppositions to your use of the mosquito mm. as a separate night striking mm. force the bomb load? Well, it was only four 500 pounders yes. when I got the mosquito. But de Havilland, with the best will in the world, just simply bul bulged the Bombay so that we could carry a blockbuster. But there was also that is no joke. a correlation between the loss rate and the penetration rate of the mosquito. Mm. It was as wonderful. As opposed to the main force. Mm. The loss rate was very low, down about one, one and a half percent. Uh, the penetration was through to Berlin with those losses. Whereas if you'd sent main force, it would have been anything from, well, up to 10%, or as you know, on the Berlin the yes. thing itself, much worse. Yes. The Mosquito was a wonderfully economic airplane, not only in construction and using materials that weren't needed elsewhere, but also in operation it was economic in loss rates yes. above all else. Yes, yes. Well, sir, time has astonishingly flown on. Uh, we, we really are down to our last few minutes. Yes. And, and I would ask you, if I may now, to, to stand slightly back from the, the wartime career. Um, you commented earlier when we were talking to Wing Commander Bramley and myself about the proportions of responsibility in a captain, mm -hmm. how much proportion should be for various things. I'd like you to, if you would, repeat that reflection on the percentage for um, how, much, how much time you should devote to navigation and how much time you should devote to the other parts. Well, I, I think in all air operations, the navigational side <coughs> is tremendously important. It's predominant. Uh, and nobody can be really a good captain of aircraft in command of something 
unless he knows where he's going, yes. putting that metaphorically or yes. actually. And I would say that a good captain of aircraft should be very strong on navigation, reasonably strong on technical matters, engineering, and on the radar and electronics, and just a little bit on moving the levers, 5%. <laughs> and when he moves away from flying the aeroplane himself, when he reaches positions of influence and authority, mm -hmm. as uh, I suggested right at the start of our conversation, um, you have always been an independently minded gentleman, very clearly. You made that point, we're going to argue over in the bar, about it's not a good thing to be right. But a commander has to be right, hasn't he? He, in, he, he should have to be right, and he should be recognised when he is right. And that's a characteristic which the nation should develop. <coughs> How are we going to do that? How can we do that in peace time? Uh, I think if we could merely educate our people by leadership, to believe that those who achieve something are better than those who don't. We could do it this very day, if you look around Britain today in all walks of life. We find that the people who get, shall we say, the big jobs, the nice cushy jobs, are people who have consistently failed. So how, in a place like the Staff College, are you going to encourage the right kind of leadership in peacetime? In peacetime it is difficult, but I think if you sell the idea that what matters is not good intentions, we used to have a phrase, to be keen is not enough. You have to get results. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to sell in the Air Force. You've got to get results. And make it clear that people who shoot a line, who have public relations officers and all this, not, they're not the people that we want. We want the people who can show in a bombing competition that they are hitting the target. And but the fighters that they are doing the interception. We want results to be the criterion for leadership. Positive-minded people will achieve those results. Negative-minded people won't. Thank you very much indeed, sir. I think that is an excellent point on which to leave the conversation. And again, sir, if I may thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning at Bracknell. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.